hello, and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute Cancer Immunotherapy and You Patient Education Webinar Series. I'm Dr. Arthur Brodsky, Assistant Director of Scientific Content at the Cancer Research Institute. And during today's webinar, we'll be focusing on new horizons and cellular therapy, harnessing natural killer cells to fight cancer. Over the next half hour, we'll be speaking with two CRI scientists who are performing cutting edge research in natural killer cells or NK cells and hear from them about these important immune cells and their applications in cancer immunotherapy, both currently and moving forward. In particular, they'll be highlighting what NK cells are and how we know they're important in cancer, the potential benefits that NK cell immunotherapies could offer for patients, and discuss some promising natural killer cell approaches that are currently being evaluated in clinical trials. Toward the end, we'll also hopefully have some time to answer some audience questions, uh, which you can enter via the Q&A box below. So before we begin, I'd like to quickly thank our generous sponsors of this webinar series, Bristol Myers Squibb and Alchemies. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's expert guests. Uh, first, we have Dr. Louis Lanier, a world-renowned natural killer cell pioneer and CRI Scientific Advisory Council member at the, Univers at the University of California, San Francisco. And, we, and also we have Dr. Oscar Aguilar, a CRI funded postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Lanier's lab, whose research is, an ex is exploring an important aspect of NK cell biology. So thank you two for joining us today. Uh, I guess we can hop right in. So first uh, I was hoping you all could explain what are natural killer cells and how do we know they're important in cancer? All right. Well, I guess I'm, I'll take that question since I've been working on natural killer cells since 1981. They were discovered as an activity in 1975, and about 81, we actually could detect them and identify them. It's about 10 to 20 percent of the lymphocytes in your, in your bloodstream and in your other lymphoid organs. And we know they're important based on a really seminal observation by one of my classmates uh, in, at Chapel Hill, who was a grad student with, uh, at the same time as me. She discovered the first human that was found to have no natural killer cells. This was a young woman. And what she suffered from was certain viral infections, which ultimately killed her. Um, and these were largely herpes viruses. She had normal B and T cells and other immune cells, but without NK cells, you know, she ultimately died of viral infections. We've also studied, this is a rare disease, but we've also studied a couple of other patients uh, who had no natural killer cells the woman got cervical cancer, and the guy has warts that he can't control, and both of them have trouble with viral infections. So based on Christine Byron's kind of seminal observation in 1989, we really know why us humans have NK cells. Great. Um, and I was hoping, uh, you know, you, you could maybe explain a little bit more about the role that uh, natural killer cells play within our immune system as these sentinels that can kind of go around um, and not only kill cancer cells directly, um, but also kind of act as an orchestrator of the immune system and trigger other cells, namely T and B cells, uh, to help kind of aid in the immune response. I was hoping you could elaborate on that a little bit. Oscar, maybe you can <laughs> help fill in that question. So NK cells are really, really, uh, they're, they're, they're equipped with these specialized proteins that they can detect any, anything that's harmful in our, in our bodies. And once they get activated, they release these soluble factors, which um, then influence the other parts of the immune system. What's also uh, unique about these cells is that they're equipped with these receptors or these proteins on their cell surface that can detect um, antibodies that are being generated by our immune systems. And of course, now with, with uh, in the age of COVID and everything that we've been going through, uh, I think everyone's pretty much aware of what, what antibodies are, but these are specialized proteins that are able to target specific uh, proteins. In the case of COVID, it's they're targeting um, proteins that are generated by the virus, but we're also employing antibodies for targeting um, specific proteins that are expressed on cancers. So using antibodies, uh, NK cells can directly kill antibody coated cells using this machinery uh, that they express. And what's unique uh, and really supporting what, uh, what Lewis was saying is that um, there are some individuals that have different variants of, of this machinery, uh, of this receptor called CD16. And um, they, those people that have uh, variants that have better, better detection capacity of, of recognizing the antibody actually have better prognosis. 
That's that's really interesting. And I, so I want to dig down into that a little more. Um, you know, obviously the antibodies are naturally produced by our immune system uh, to help us with threats, but also in the case of cancer, we sometimes use antibodies. Uh, in the case of blood cancers, one that target one called rituximab that targets a CD20 receptor. Uh, and then another one, uh, Herceptin, HER2, that targets the HER2 receptor in a variety of cancers. Uh, and to your point, Oscar, where uh, this, this CD16 receptor that binds the antibodies uh, kind of influences patient, how patients uh, respond to treatment sometimes. Do, could you, uh, whichever of you would like to take it, uh, talk a little bit about more about those studies uh, where it found out that uh, p how patients responded to immunotherapy depended on what type of NK cells they had. Oscar, please. So uh, th there's some some studies that uh, that have been reported, and by the way, I should mention that CD16 is not only expressed on NK cells, but it's also expressed on other parts of the innate immune system. But they definitely uh, um, researchers went in and they, they've identified specific variants, also known as alleles, of this receptor, and they showed that when they tracked patients that had this this allele or this variant that was better at recognizing antibodies, uh, they were more effective at at uh, controlling and responding to the antibodies that were being injected and ultimately uh, result in better outcomes for the patient. That's, that's pretty fascinating to hear. And uh, you know, I should mention that these, these therapies have been around for a decade or more. Um, and we've kind of, I know they were kind of initially designed to that, but designed for that. Uh, but we've kind of learned a little bit more about how to tap in NK cells power. So how are newer antibody-based therapies uh, using this antibody dependent natural killer cell killing to t tap into NK cells power against cancer? Well, I've been involved in uh, helping some biotech companies involved in those processes. So what they've been doing is making what's called bispecific antibodies. So antibodies are kind of Y-shaped molecules. You have one arm and you have a second arm. So with the one arm, if you grab the cancer, the second arm can grab the NK cell by one of its receptors that can turn the NK cell on. These are called bispecific antibodies. So one of the you know, new strategies, and there is already one, I believe, approved drug which works in that manner. So one of the arms grabs this CD16 molecule Oscar mentioned, which will activate the NK cell. The other arm will grab a molecule that's expressed on the surface of Hodgkin's lymphoma cells. Now you bring the NK cell with the cancer cell together, the NK cell knows who to kill and kills it. So there's a lot of new variations of that theme of using antibodies with one arm that would grab the NK cell and turn it on. And with the other arm, you know, grab various types of cancer cells. For example, if you used a HER2 re reactive arm, that would combine to a breast cancer cell. So these are in clinical trials currently. Uh, so that's been kind of you know, a very new way uh, to engage the NK cell and use it as a cancer therapeutic. That's great to hear. You know, as we've, as we've learned more about the NK cell biology and also our engineering skills or engineering tools have increased, it's nice to see those being brought together to, to help patients, hopefully. Um, and so, you know, those bispecific antibodies are also made for T cells, which are kind of the, kind of get all the glory in immunotherapy these days. Um, and so in addition to targeting NK cells with antibodies, um, like T cell therapies, doctors can also just infuse the actual NK cells into patients for treatment. So in, in this context, what benefits do natural killer cells offer? And what are some of these promising uh, cell cellular therapy approaches that are being evaluated in clinical trials right now? So as you know, and have probably seen a lot of press, there are a lot of these uh, cells called, you know, CAR T cells, where you put a new receptor in the T cell, infuse that into patients. These are FDA approved, are working quite well in leukemia and lymphoma. But one of the problems is, is that the T cells are responding too strongly. And in fact, when they respond too strongly as an off target have killed people. So you have to be very careful. The good thing about NK cells, NK cells have been infused into patients now for more than 20 years and have never killed anyone. That's the upside. They're safe. So now we're trying to have them work as efficiently as the T cell in going after these leukemias and lymphomas, but without the side effect of the toxicity. That's obviously great to hear. 
Um, and uh, could you also talk a little bit about, uh, I want to throw in a little technical term here, allogeneic, uh, meaning that you wouldn't need to necessarily, you could treat a patient not necessarily by taking their own NK cells, um, but by having donor NK cells that could be, as they say, off the shelf, uh, that could be kind of waiting for a patient so that they could be not waiting, but uh, they're, they're ready so that when they are needed, they can be deployed quickly. Could you talk about some of these efforts? They're in the fridge. That's what you mean by off the shelf. <laughs> you pull them out of the fridge and <laughs> warm them up and put them in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so allergenic means, for example, if you take urine K cells and give them to me, they're called allergenic because they're not mine. If you do that with your T cells, your T cells will attack me and cause what's called graft versus host disease and, you know, really wreak havoc. In K cells are much better behaved. If you take urine K cells and stick them into me, they won't attack my, my normal healthy tissues, unlike your allergenic T cells would do. So that's, the, that's why there's a lot of excitement about the NK cell, that it won't cause, you know, it, urine K cells won't attack me if I get urine K cells. That's allergenic, which means, you know, in theory, you could, you know, take urine K cells, freeze them down, and when, if I got cancer, pull them out of the freezer, bomb, inject them into me and not worry about, you know, them attacking my normal tissues, but hopefully preferentially attacking my cancer cells, particularly if I tell them what my cancer cells look like, if I can point them towards that with, for example, an antibody or putting in a chimeric receptor. And this could presumably, going back to uh, uh, earlier, Oscar, you were mentioning um, that how NK, what, how effective NK cells are at binding an antibody and killing the cell that's attached to it, in this case, a cancer cell, depends on that CD16 receptor and it, it, it has to have a certain type or it won't be as effective. So could this, this, off, this, this donor approach to NK cell therapy, could that, that could presumably overcome that, right? We, so we're, we're, we're really, uh, and, and research is going at such a fast pace and we're just the ability that we are able to do to the cells in terms of cellular engineering is moving at such a fast rate that we can definitely take um, a patient's NK cells and modify them to have this version of CD16 that has better capacity or any other receptor, uh, be it a chimeric one or, or an endogenous one, that's gonna be more responsive at, at detecting a given cancer. I understand. And that's, so, being, yeah, that's being done clinically. In fact, there are companies which are taking in K cells and putting in this nice, you know, high affinity or this really good in case this CD, good CD16 that binds antibodies very strongly. So if your in K cells don't have that good version of CD16, it can be put in genetically. And then you give that person also some antibodies that would tell those in K cells to kill the tumor. Ah, uh, interesting, interesting. Um, and so Oscar, I want to dive a little bit more into your research, uh, but first really quick, I just wanted to kind of talk about one last thing when it comes to these NK cell therapies, the, the actual cell-based ones. Um, aside from the natural ones or uh, adding, a, adding the right version of the CD16, what other kind of modifications are, are being explored with NK cells uh, that are being tested in therapy, whether it be attaching a CAR receptor or helping to make a, a better type of memory NK cell that goes in? Lewis, I think you're, you're, this is your area. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, now, you know, with CRISPR, it's possible to do lots of modifications of NK cells. So that's, that is being done. For example, there are certain uh, molecules inside the NK cell that kind of slow them down. You can remove those. There's a molecule called CISH, which normally kind of keeps NK cells, you know, calm. These are take breaks out, in a way. It's a break. It's a break. You take that out they go much better. Uh, the, the other possibility, as Oscar mentioned, is you can put in these chimeric receptors. These are a receptor that on the outside of the cell tells the NK cell which tumor to kill based on recognizing something on the surface of that tumor and then transmitting the activating signal based on the pieces that you put on the inside of that receptor to make the NK cell go. Um, also, people are putting in growth factors into the NK cells so that they can be more highly activated and can also then divide 
as well as just kill, make more of themselves. Those, those are in patience right now. Sounds really interesting, kind of increasing the size of the army to give them the best chance of, of rooting out all the cancer cells. Uh, so, like, sorry, sorry, before I wanted to add also, um, uh, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of work that's been uh, done by a number of researchers, including work that's been done in, uh, in Lewis's lab here. Um, there's, we've, we've found um, that these NK cells, for the longest time, we thought that they were Part of the innate branch of the immune system and this is a part of the immune system that's generally uh, short-lived and half-life of an nk cell is about two weeks but now we've identified a number of instances where these nk cells can actually generate memory that are long that uh, can live for long term and have the ability to to respond to a certain harmful cell more effective the second time around and this is also something that uh, we're, work, we're working with, trying to understand how to make these cells more effective and what we can learn from them. Interesting. That's, that's really exciting that they could, you know, they could kind of have an immune memory and, and get more effective over time. Um, and kind of related to that, we have an audience question that after uh, you've given an NK cell treatment and assuming that the NK, say, NK cells are able to eliminate the, the, all of the cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment, uh, what kind of immune response or immune activity would happen after that? Um, you, I guess you kind of alluded to this earlier, Lewis, um, but I was hoping maybe you could share a little bit, bit about more, I guess, of what do the NK cells do after they've done their job against the cancer? They prime the pump. So when they actually kill some of these cancer cells, they kill those cells, which release, release fragments of these cancer cells, that then your adaptive immune system can take up those fragments of the cancer cell and now you can get B and T cells recognized. Also, when they're killing, NK cells also secrete factors that Oscar was talking about that will call in other members of the army. It'll call in the myeloid cells, call in the T cells, say, come, I need some help. And that can then prime the pump. So even though initially the NK cells job is, I call them the Marine Corps, they're first on the beach. They kill some cells, but then they call in the rest of the of the army, the artillery, the air, <laughs> the air support, they bring everybody else in. And that can then create, you know, T cells or B cells, which can then give you years long memory against the cancer. When it works well, that's how it works. That's really interesting to hear. Um, and so Oscar, your, your research is, is really looking at that, uh, the, the kind of central activity that we've been talking about, about the NK cells binding an antibody and then triggering and then activating the NK cells so that they can do their job. Uh, could you share any insights you've uncovered so far in your work, uh, as well as how moving forward, uh, some of your insights might aid the development of better NK cell immunotherapies in the future? Absolutely. Um, so I, um, talking about these memory NK cells, uh, what, what's interesting about them is that there's a subset of these membrane case cells that some patients uh, have um, that actually have more effective responses at recognizing antibodies on, on a given target cell. So because of that, um, my project was really trying to understand, well, can we generate these cells in a mouse? Um, and how do these NK cells respond um, by, by doing some of this, these studies in the mouse that we can't do in humans, of course. Um, so, what I found early on, though, is that mouse and case cells are really, really lousy at killing antibody-coated cells. Um, however, if you, if we can, we can now engine engineer these NK cells in a mice to mimic and parallel the 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 really potent uh, NK responses that we see in in patients. So my work is really trying to generate this mouse model, um, and and we're almost there at, at really predicting how these cells behave. And why that's really, really important and critical is because if we understand the, the signals that these NK cells get and what that happens to them afterwards, we can then start asking questions about how we can make them more effective therapeutically at, at killing not only cancer cells, but also other sort of pathogenic and harmful cells. And, and Oscar mentioned, you know, your average garden variety NK cell lives probably two to four weeks and then dies and is replaced. But we know that there's these special, you know, these this special class of, of NK cells in humans and mice that can live for months or maybe years. So Oscar's work is trying to figure out 
what makes those cells special, what makes them kill better, what makes them last longer. So if we can actually figure that out, we can make much better in case cells either through engineering in a plastic dish or perhaps doing something to the patient to result in the generation of more of that flavor of NK cell. So having a nice you know, mouse model where you can manipulate things and test drugs and test, test antibodies would really advance the field doing experiments that you, know, you, you, you can't do with people. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And obviously that then once you can kind of create that self-sustaining and, and sustain and the one that subsists over time, uh, obviously it eliminates, or it makes it so that you might not have to treat a patient again, if their immune system can kind of take it from there moving forward, should anything else pop up. Um, and so we have a, we have a question from our audience that kind of piggybacks on, uh, you, on your research, Oscar. They ask if there would be a difference between uh, when NK cells are activated with the bispecific antibodies you, you two were discussing earlier versus the regular uh, regular antibodies, the FC portion on them. Would, would there be a difference with how it can influence the NK cell activity afterwards? So I, I would say that uh, there may be a difference. And the reason why is because these bispecific antibodies sometimes trigger not just CD16, but also additional uh, receptors on NK cells. So you may get uh, even in more enhanced um, responses on the NK cells using these bispecific antibodies, I would predict. Is that accurate, Lewis? Yeah, in fact, you know, in, in the clinic right now are antibodies which will bind a tumor. The FC portion of the bispecific will bind the CD16 that Oscar works on, but then the other arm grabs another activating NK receptor. So now I call it the turbocharger. You've got CD16 engaged, but if you grab and simultaneously tickle another activated receptor, you've turbocharged that response. That's yeah. in clinic. That's exciting. Um, and so now we have we have another question from our audience that actually nicely syncs up with what I what I was planning to ask anyway as a follow up. Um, but talking about these, you know, immunotherapy, our current ones, not the necessarily the NK cell ones, uh, but current immunotherapies like checkpoints work really well on what we call hot tumors that the immune system is kind of already recognized and infiltrated. And then the, the checkpoint immunotherapies just kind of take off that final break and let them do their job. Um, so th this question from the audience is asking if NK cells might have the potential to turn cold tumors, uh, which wouldn't normally be responsive to immunotherapy into hot tumors. Uh, and make them more responsive to immunotherapy. And I guess the, the second part of the question that I would add on is, uh, you know, because there's a synergy potentially between the NK cells and the T cells, uh, as well as the therapies that, tar that take advantage of both of them, what do we know at the moment about uh, how NK cell therapies might synergize with current immunotherapies? Well, I think, uh, you know, some of these checkpoint therapies, most of them currently are targeting T cells. You know. However, Many of those molecules that are expressed on T cells as checkpoints, they're also on NK cells. So when you put in the drug, you're not just affecting the T cell, you're also affecting the NK cells. But even if it's only affecting the T cells, when you activate T cells, they secrete a lot of goodies that can help the NK cells get going. For example, you know, when you put in these antibodies, for example, to CTLA4 or PD1, those are common checkpoint molecules that are FDA approved, you know, it sets off the secretion of all these cytokines, which can in fact cause some trouble, but they can also as bystanders wake up your NK cells because obviously if you have cancer, your NK cells aren't working real well. But now if the T cells start providing them goodies, it can wake them up, make them activated, and they can join in the gang to go after the tumor. Interesting. Yeah, it's a, an important point you brought up for sure that with the power of the immune system, you've got to make sure to kind of charge it and activate it in the right way, lest you get too big of a response as we sometimes see with T cell therapies. Right. Um, and so, you know, with the, with the CAR T cell therapies that you discussed earlier, as well as some of the NK cell therapies, I understand that at least initially they've been much more effective for blood cancers, uh, whether it's leukemia, uh, lymphoma, myeloma. Um, and I guess the current thinking is that this is most, or one of the reasons anyway, um, in addition to some targeting factors is that these blood cancers don't really have that fortress of the tumor microenvironment around it protecting them. Um, so it's easier for the CAR T cells or the NK cells to actually get to those. But with NK cells or with solid tumors, uh, which are most of the ones we know, whether it's brain, breast, lung, 
Um, those they kind of like I had they have that that fortress that tumor microenvironment around them that can kind of protect them. So uh, I was hoping that you might be able to speak about some of the challenges of these NK cell therapies and applying them to solid tumors. Well, something has to tell the NK cell to come out of the blood and get into the solid tumor, right? They're not just going to go there randomly. So it, it, in many cases, in the local tumor environment, there are cells secreting these molecules called chemokines that bring in other cells. So if that doesn't happen, if there's no cells in the solid tumor that spit out these, these tags, which tell the NK cell, get out of the blood and come here and help me, uh, then you know they're, they're not going to go there. So you've got to figure out how to overcome that problem. And the second is that the solid tumors often secrete a lot of factors that turn off both NK cells and T cells. So you need to get rid of those. Uh, there are you know molecules in the in in the clinic right now to try and neutralize or get rid of some of those suppressive factors, like one called TGF beta. There are there are, but because if the NK cell comes into a tumor, gets soaked in TGF beta made by the tumor or the surrounding stromal cells, it, it downregulates a lot of their, of their activating receptors and you know, just turns them off. That happens normally because like if you get a wound, uh, you, know, you, 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 cut, you cut your hand, you've got to repair that. You don't want NK cells or T cells coming in and causing havoc. So that's why Physiologically, you know, when you have a site, it can secrete these, these immunosuppressive molecules so that you keep things calm enough to repair the damage. In the case of cancer, that's bad because it's calming down the cells. You want to get, to get rid of the cancer, not to heal the cut on your hand. Uh, it's, it's almost overwhelming to kind of think about the, the dance that the immune system does with our healthy tissues uh, to kind of keep them in order. and you know, getting cancer to eliminate the bad ones that are sometimes hard, a little hard to root out. Um, so real quick, before we wrap up, uh, I wanted to give both of you a chance to kind of just give your closing thoughts uh, and share a little bit about where do you see natural killer cell therapies uh, fitting into the field of oncology and cancer immunotherapy? And I guess we'll start with you, Oscar. I think this is a really exciting time, not only for NK cells, but also for, for, for the immune system. I think the more and more we learn about how our cells behave. Because the thing is that we know very well how our immune system behaves to uh, virus infections and bacteria infections, but cancer is still stuff that we're, how they behave in the tumor microenvironment is still uh, things that we're learning. And the more we learn, the more effective we're gonna be at harnessing the true power of the entire immune system, including in case cells, which are really, really critical um, in my, in my non-biased opinion. <laughs> Well, so I'm very happy to see I, I started working on NK cells in 1981 when people didn't even acknowledge that those cells existed. To actually, you know, prove that that's true, they do exist, but now be able to figure out, you know, how they work. And more importantly, how do we make them work better? You know, we are getting the tools now to be able to do that. And I said, you know, for in cancer particularly, I said, it's nice to have T cells, but we know that's only, you know, curing, you know, 20% of patients with certain types of cancer. I say you got to bring the whole army on the field, which will include NK cells. So if you can get a cooperation going, like you do in physiological situations, like you know, during viral infections, where we know that NK cells and T cells cooperate and you need both of them, proven by that, you know, those patients who don't have NK cells, we need in cancer to bring on everybody. And NK cells will maybe be playing a critical role in that process if we can make them work efficiently. Yeah, it's definitely, I agree with you both, but it's definitely been a very exciting time for immunotherapy lately. And, you know, it, obviously a lot of patients have been helped, but as you mentioned, the majority still aren't getting helped. And so, you know, kind of as we expand our immune arsenal, hopefully we'll be able to help a lot more of them. So that is all the time that we have for today. Um, I just wanna thank you two so much for sharing your expertise and your insights with us. Um, and for our audience, I want to let you know that for more of our webinars and additional resources we have for patients and caregivers as part of CRI's Answer to Cancer educational programs, we encourage you to check out our website at cancerresearch.org patients. 
Here, you can read and watch stories shared by others who have received immunotherapy treatment across a wide variety of cancer types. You can browse our entire library of past webinars an immunotherapy patient summit series featuring the world's leading immunotherapy experts. You can access information on other resources, including treatment, emotional support, and financial assistance. And you can find help locating an immunotherapy clinical trial with one of our clinical trial navigators. I'd also like to thank uh, one last time our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb and Alchemies for making this webinar series possible. Uh, and thank you all for your attention today. I really hope that you found today's webinar interesting and informative. Uh, and again, you can watch this and all of our other webinars on our website at cancerresearch.org slash webinars to learn more about the immunotherapy options in a number of cancer types. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Lanier, Dr. Aguilar, I'd like to really thank you both so much uh, for sharing your insights with us today and for the incredible work you're doing to advance our understanding of natural killer cells and immunotherapy. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you to the CRI.